Hey guys, this is Air, and welcome to the 29th episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on Abel, or Abel Revio Ochoa, who was executed just a few months ago on February 6th, 2020 in Texas for murdering five of his family members back in 2002. At the time of his death, he was the third person to be executed this year and the second in the state of Texas. Abel was born on January 23, 1973 in Mexico. His parents were born and raised in Mexico and they came from a poor family of farmers. Abel had two sisters who died when they were young and two brothers, with him being the middle child, and he was also given his father's exact name. His father, Abel Sr., made it to the fourth grade and had no education after that. He served three years in the Mexican army, and his main duties were to look for drug traffickers, and he felt the job was too dangerous for his family, so he got out of the army and decided to move to Dallas, Texas to find work. He worked in America for a little over a year before sending for his wife and kids, and Abel was just two years old when he came to America. Abel Sr. worked on a dairy farm and also harvested watermelon and sometimes would make as little as $3 a day. Things started to get a bit more steady for him, but he lost his job on the farm because his boss passed away. He became an alcoholic and was struggling for about five years and in his own words said that he was abusive to his wife and all of his kids. He also admitted that when he would beat on his son Abel, it would not be because he did anything wrong but because he was drunk and taking his anger out on him. He had three DUIs and overall the household was in shambles. Abel's brothers, Gabriel and Javier, did not graduate high school, but Abel was able to complete high school and get his diploma. A couple of years after graduating high school, he began a relationship with a woman by the name of Cecilia, and the two of them married in December 1993. Abel was 20 years old and Cecilia was 23. He had no kids prior to their marriage, and Cecilia also claimed that she too had no kids. There was a three-year-old little boy named Jonathan in the family being raised by Cecilia's mother at the time, and Cecilia claimed that Jonathan was her nephew. A year after they married, Abel and Cecilia had a daughter who was born in November 1994, and her name was Crystal. The two seemingly had a good relationship with one another, and they both had great jobs. Cecilia was a Head Start teacher, and Abel got a job that he would eventually keep for 11 years working as a heavy equipment operator. A few years later in 1997, Abel found out that Cecilia's nephew Jonathan was really her biological son. Abel broke things off with Cecilia because he could not handle the fact that she had a child out of wedlock and lied about something so serious for so many years. While the couple was separated, Abel threatened to kill Cecilia and her children. He became very aggressive and volatile as well. This is part of a transcribed recorded telephone call between Abel and Cecilia during their breakup. Why do you want to kill us? What do you mean? We haven't done anything to you. You're the one that left. I am leaving. I am fixing to hang up. I have nothing else to say. If you have anything to say about my daughter, call me. If not, don't call me. You're not going to know nothing about your daughter. Why not? If she gets sick or anything, you don't worry about us. We're not going to worry about you. You don't worry about me. My daughter worries about me, and I worry about her. How do you know she worries about you? Well, see, you're starting to piss me off again. You want me to go shoot you right now? What's wrong with you, man? Why do you act that way? Why do you say these words to me? Jerk. Abel later admitted to threatening her and would only do so when she would make him angry. Six months after they split, they ended up getting back together, but their fighting continued and Abel began to verbally and physically hurt Cecilia. Two years after their six-month breakup in 1999, Child Protective Services were involved, but Marley Meisner, who was the spokeswoman for that investigation, said that the agency was unable to identify any abuse and declined to release any further information. Abel soon began to heavily drink and also started his new crack cocaine habit. Despite his drug use, 
Abel and Cecilia had a second daughter together by the name of Anahi, who was born on October 7, 2001. Things were progressively getting worse, and Abel's drug use was the cause of majority of their arguments. Because of his addiction, Abel ended up quitting his job of 11 years in April 2002. A couple of months later, he was checked into a rehab for two months because he was using crack cocaine once every few days. After leaving rehab, he continued using crack, but said that he would only use it about every week or so. On August 4, 2002, which was a Sunday, Abel and his family attended church. Church got out at around 2 o'clock p.m., and while in the car, he asked his wife for $10 so that he could buy a dime bag of crack. Cecilia initially refused, but being that their daughters were in the car, she prevented an argument and gave Abel the $10. Instead of going home, he drove his wife and kids to the crack house and left them inside the car so he could buy his drugs. After his purchase, he drove back home. At his house, Cecilia's two sisters, Alma and Jacqueline, and his father-in-law, Bartolo, were in the living room watching TV and socializing. Cecilia joined her family in the living room with her nine-month-old Anahi while Crystal was playing throughout the house. Abel went to the backyard to smoke his crack alone, and when he was finished, he went into his bedroom to lay down. He turned on the TV but was not able to focus on watching TV because he was craving more crack. Cecilia went into the bedroom and confronted Abel about not saying hi to her family and he responded by saying that he did not want them to see him in that state and he felt that he looked funny from just smoking. Cecilia left and shortly after she left, Abel wanted to go and ask Cecilia for more money but he knew that it would start an argument. Instead of asking Cecilia, he decided to get his 9mm handgun that he had purchased back in 1997 for protection that was stashed away in the closet. With gun in hand, he went to the living room and started opening fire on the whole family. Cecilia's sister Alma was shot and was in critical condition, but she was able to escape and made it to the neighbor's house who ended up calling 911. Abel ran out of bullets and went back into his closet to reload his gun. When he made it back to the living room, he made eye contact with his seven-year-old daughter who had not yet been hit, and when she saw the gun, she began to run away, and Abel chased after her and shot her to death. He recounted that that was the last person he killed, and everyone else was dead, which included his father-in-law, his sister-in-law Jacqueline, his nine-month-old, and his wife Cecilia. Abel then went back into his room and grabbed his wife's purse and then drove to a local shopping center in Dallas, Texas in an attempt to get money out of an ATM using Cecilia's debit card. What he did not know was that Cecilia had changed her PIN code so he was unable to withdraw any money for his crack. He left the shopping center and was unaware of what to do so he ended up driving back into the shopping center and that is when he was stopped and questioned by police. It was less than 20 minutes after the shooting and Abel was arrested. While being put into the back of the police car, he began to cry and asked if his baby was okay and told the officer he could not believe what he did. He admitted everything and even made a detailed confession. Abel was tried in a Dallas County court and his legal team tried to argue that he was in a state of delirium that was induced by his cocaine use. Taking the stand was a psychiatrist who let the court know that cocaine-induced delirium was a medically recognized disease in the dsm 4 Within the dsm 4 it catalogs different psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia and depression. He also stated that delirium is a very serious mental state and a person's level of consciousness is disrupted which inhibits them from being able to shift their attention and they can only focus on being aggressive or irritated while in that state. His legal team failed to persuade the jury and less than a year after the murders, on May 15, 2003, Abel was convicted of aggravated murder and sentenced to death by method of lethal injection. Abel spent 17 years on death row and throughout his time had no infractions and his legal team tried to get his sentence commuted to life in prison because they felt that he was a remorseful changed man who mentored other men in prison. His last final ditch to halt his execution was denied by the Supreme Court on February 6, 2020, the same day as his execution. 
Abel wanted a stay of execution until his pending lawsuit was final. He tried suing because he felt that his rights were violated when he was prevented from filming a final interview with his legal team. The courts ruled that his rights were not violated and no one else could intervene in putting a hold on his execution. It was Thursday evening, February 6, 2020, at the Texas State Penitentiary at Huntsville, less than an hour after his final appeal was denied. After being strapped in, he professed his faith, thanked his father, and said, I want to apologize to my in-laws for causing all of this emotional pain. I love y'all and consider y'all my sister I never had. I want to thank you for forgiving me. Abel died a little after 6 o'clock p.m. In an interview with his stepson Jonathan after the execution, he said his family did not have blood on their hands and that balance was brought to the situation and that they were living in a moment where justice was served. After 17 years, me, my family, my grandfather, my aunts, and my uncles can finally say that we got closure. We got justice. A reporter asked Jonathan if he forgave Abel Ochoa, and he said that he forgave him. I accept the fact that as a child, at 12 years old, when I buried my mom, my sisters, my aunt, and my grandfather, that nothing is going to bring them back, and it's up to me to keep their memory alive. I can't ever replace my mother or my sisters, but through future generations, my goal is to keep their names alive. Thank you guys for watching, and I would like to give a shout out to Harley. Thank you very much for becoming a patron on my Patreon and interacting with the channel. I truly appreciate your support. And now for discussion and question time. Have any of you ever had to deal with enabling a family member who was addicted to drugs? The easy thing for me to say is that Cecilia should have left Abel and never given him any money for crack right after church, but after watching shows like Intervention, I've seen so many parents and spouses enable their loved ones because they feel guilty or just want to prevent them from committing crimes in order to get money a different way for the drugs. Also, some just might want to know that they're safe and not off in the streets. I wonder if his so-called crack-induced delirium happened more than once and if it happened in front of his kids. Cecilia was a teacher and was living in a home with a crack addict and going on runs with Abel to buy crack. And if you think about it, it's truly scary that you never know what people do behind closed doors and how you can just see an innocent child at the store and not know what they're dealing with at home or what burdens they have to face. I also read a trial transcript where Abel was telling the judge that he had no recollection of the murders, but then was able to clearly recall that he saw his daughter and chased her when she tried to run away. Do you believe that he was in a state of delirium or just pretending not to remember to support his defense? I am a square and know nothing about drugs, but do any of you out there know if $10 worth of crack can put you in a state of delirium? And last, I would like to talk about how Cecilia kind of reminds me of Ruth Ellis in a way, how they were both in abusive relationships and the abuser ended up leaving the relationship. Why do you guys think that some of these women go back to the abusers when they were free? Happy birthday, Oliver Productions.